Y'all ready to be history? Get started. Welcome. Hi. 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 Hello, everyone. To the Pro Audio Suite. These guys are professional. They're motivated. Thanks to Tribooth, the best vocal booth for home or on the road voice recording. And Austrian Audio, making passion heard. Introducing Robert Marshall from Source Elements and Someone Audio Post, Chicago. Darren Robert Robertson from Voodoo Radio Imaging, Sydney. Tech to the VO stars, George the Tech Whitam from LA. And me, Andrew Peters, voiceover talent and home studio guy. Line up, lady! Here we go. Welcome to another Pro Audio Suite. Thanks to the Tribooth. Uh, don't forget the code PAP200 to get $200 off. And Austrian Audio, making passion heard. This week we're talking about Nexus, which is kind of timely because um, if you are going to buy Nexus, I think you get 20% off until June 30. Is that right, Robert? There, There is. Some, someone sneaked one by. We usually don't do sales. Well, there so, you go. Yes. Oh, oh. Better hurry up and get this cut and out on the air. Yeah. Or out on, <laughs> yeah, the, on, out right. on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, there, you brought something up the other day, George, about Nexus, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, you discovered something that got you out of trouble. Well, I got one of my clients out of trouble. I didn't even have to do it. With an Apollo. Yeah, it was an Apollo. What do you know? Um, <laughs> there's going to be confusing audio drivers. It's probably Apollo-related, and it definitely was. So, yeah, in this case, this was a really, really out there situation where the user was getting the virtual inputs to work on the Apollo for most things, even on Chrome. However, and this is on a Mac, by the way, when he played a video on YouTube, it ignored the routing through the virtual channels and it would only show up on the monitor channels. I have absolutely no way to to understand. I don't understand what's going on under the hood in Chrome enough to even understand how a different website could route audio in a different way in the same browser, but that's precisely what was happening. And so he was clever enough, smart enough, and patient enough to try solutions. And the one that worked for him was was using Nexus. He said, when I use Nexus to essentially pound the Apollo drivers, that fixed the problem. <laughs> now everything's fine. Robert, does that make any remote sense at all? I'm trying to understand exactly what he did. So he's, I think what he was trying to do is get his web browser to play. So a very common scenario with the Apollo, because I'm very, I'm very intimately familiar with these issues is the Apollo has virtual sound drivers for different outputs. So they're called virtual Mm -hmm. outputs, right? So if you hit play on any wave file on any machine and it, and it, the default channels on the Apollo, it's going to come out of our monitor left, right, right? Your speakers. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Unless you want it to go anywhere else, then it's useless. So if you want it to go to headphones, if you want it to go to an aux send, if you want it to go to literally any place else in the system, it doesn't help you. Right. Right. Now it's coming up on a virtual channel and now you can send it to an aux channel. Exactly. Right, and now it's routable, and you know. So, what what were the apps that he was successfully using with the vir- with the virtual? Really, everything. <laughs> pretty Minimum. much everything. What, pretty what much everything, again? right? Well, I'm trying to find the uh, my I'm, right now. I'm trying to navigate to my own my own Facebook group. Uh, I posted this whole thing on Universal Audio Apollo for voiceover on Facebook. My Facebook group for people using the Apollo for voiceover. And I posted it about this whole thing and the the crux of it. And it's pretty long. Um, I'll try to summarize. Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Um, this development suddenly happened without warning a couple of days ago after two years of no problems. All audio from the Mac, Skype, Source Connect, Zoom, and all audio from websites on Chrome all route through the virtual channels. Okay. That, and that, that actually doesn't always work for the record. Um, he's getting that to work. But when I play a YouTube video on Chrome and Safari, only YouTube, I only hear the, the website, only YouTube That's on so Chrome weird. and Safari and Safari. I hear the audio in the monitor, but I cannot see levels in the virtual channels in the console or pro tools. It just happened. 
poof, out of the blue, and it is not resolved after rebooting several times over the last couple of days. And then the next post is his solution. Before we do the solution, the first thing is the problem, or the way he solved it the first time, is he went into the audio MIDI application and he set, because the virtual channels in the Apollo are not channels one and two, they're channels like five and six, I think. Okay, so That's you right. got to ba- basically tell the Mac that your output for monitoring is not one and two of your built-in speakers or even one and two of the Apollo. Your output is one and two of the right. uh, of the Apollo. And and I don't know, George, if you know where I'm talking about this, where you yeah. set your speakers and you can... Oh, yeah. Dude, I've done right. this hundreds so, of times. Like, I literally have a website, web page about setting So somehow, like, YouTube is ignoring that, but... YouTube is ignoring that specifically, and it's ignoring it on Safari and in So if his goal was to bring the, you know, YouTube back up into his Apollo console, then I don't see how Source Nexus does that directly. But I do see how Nexus gets it into his DAW, and his DAW goes over to his Apollo console. Or out out his Apollo. Well, um, what he said was uh, <laughs> routing through Source Nexus seems to cure all ills. I have not done an exhaustive test, but preliminary tests with YouTube are successful in routing audio to virtual tracks through Source Nexus. The problem only occurs when au- routing audio from the Mac to Apollo through the sound preferences and audio MIDI setup utility in Mac OS. So after clicking around the desktop and internet, I found some audio shows up in virtual tracks and some does not. Um, and then he goes on and, and literally goes down by website by website. Every website he found that does work and doesn't work. Like, like what does work? CNN and Fox. What does not show up in the virtual channels? YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, Netflix, HBO, and Peacock. So it is website specific what actually shows up in the virtual channels. So how did he end up using Nexus to solve it? He didn't go, he didn't go into a breakdown of his, of his setup and how he did it. Um, He said, I need to build new templates with more comprehensive source Nexus routing for conferencing. Anyway, it seems routing the computer audio through source Nexus will fix this problem specific problem as well. So the bypass will hopefully make this discussion moot in daily practice, but it sure would be interesting if someone knows enough about the architecture involved to offer an explanation for why this might have occurred. I can't explain how any website is picking off audio interfaces individually. I thought maybe it has to do with, I don't even know really. Cause, cause none of those. And this is on Mojave, by the way. This is Mojave. Yeah, I, I run Mojave all the time. I never, but I don't yeah. use Apollos. I mean, I have Apollo at the studio, but yeah, I have one sitting right here. I I, I have been using Apollos, configuring them, dis, you know, setting up systems around them for ten years. Like, I I feel like I've known every annoying quirk, every defect, every bonus feature of the Apollo inside and out. And then this comes at me from left. I mean, field basically, what he's doing is he's moving the. Like before everything was brought back to the uh, the Apollo console, and the only inputs were Apollo inputs. Like that's the way the Apollo system worked. Right. Um, by moving it over to his workstation and using Nexus, he still has a mixer to route stuff around and do whatnot with. And his inputs are again all the inputs right. from the Apollo because the Apollo gives them to the workstation, but also every other input now right. because Nexus can see everything right it's just interesting how one website could decide that or yeah i I really have no idea how that is and that's on it doesn't matter what browser even well that's really blew my mind i was like okay i can see if that happens in chrome he says the same thing happens in safari and then that's where i was like yeah insert i was like i was like is this some sort of like digital rights management thing i was thinking about that with like netflix or something it has to be a drm i don't know how it knows Right, it has to be some bit that's it's like, on I'm the not going to go to a virtual that, thing because virtual things maybe can be recorded. Right. I don't. I'm just. That's a wild guess, but just a yeah. rough guess. That's what it sounds like. Isn't that crazy? So the the fix was Nexus because now he was able to set. I, 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 again, he didn't go into detail about how he's using Nexus, but I, you know he how Nexus his, works. Yeah. You yeah, he make a virtual driver, and then you set yeah. Mac OS to speakers yep. to Nexus. 
whatever Nexus A or whatever Nexus driver. And that uh, is, a, is a way to route around this. Mm-hmm. this, this I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little trick if you want. You can also, if, if you wanted yeah. to go to your speakers sometimes, but not all the time, you can also route it to a dual output device. So you know how in you, you have aggregate uh-huh. devices in, okay, you also have dual output yes. devices. That's right. Right. You or can make an output, output that's devices, Nexus actually. and your Mac speakers. And so now you don't have yes. to like, you know, if you're not running your DAW, you still get it out your Mac speakers. If you are running your DAW, mute your Mac speakers and you get it out your your DAW. I just, I know enough about sound drivers to know that I don't understand a lot about what's going on. And I also know that they're very, very different in mm, Mac OS far. and Windows, yeah. right? There's a company making a hardware mixer that you can put on your desk that lets you mix any channel, any software source on a Windows machine. So in other words, imagine you have like a touch surface thing on your on your desktop and pulling down fader one is Chrome. Pulling down fader two is, uh, you know, another application, right? And you can, that's something you can do natively yes. in Windows that you cannot do natively no, you need, in Mac. And, and you need something like, uh, what's what's like Rogue Amoeba makes, it's not, it's not loopback, it's the other thing. Sound desk or something. Oh yeah, yeah. There's that too. You can control the volume of applications. Sound desk gets really interesting <laughs> and complicated. <laughs> you can you can get to the the volume of individual applications and control them. Usually, what happens there is that they pick off all the applications and then they send it out to your speakers. So it's like kind of like sending a driver to a driver because you have to change the mix. Yeah, I, I think there's some level yeah. of doing that or some pass from one to the other. Yeah, it's it is it is interesting. Yeah. There's definitely the ability to tap individual applications and there's sort of good ways and bad ways to do that and that's one of the reasons why sometimes loopback is tough because loopback can really get its fingers into a system and make it do weird things because it's not really uh Yeah audio hijack it's 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 they they go about it in a powerful way because without you doing anything they just sense all the audio applications that are going and um, they just grab hold of everything right. at the same time it's really invasive and you can right destabilize things and sometimes it can make weird things happen i think these systems are great for hobbyists and video game streamers people that are hackers and computer builders and people that thrive on customizing a system. But I think these systems are in general are a bad idea for, for a production studio or a voiceover, even a home voiceover studio, where if something falls apart, it will take your studio offline and you won't know what to do to fix it other than completely start over or remove it entirely and then have to then redesign your workflow on the fly. And this is why I never, ever recommend building a home voiceover booth around virtual sound drivers like Loopback. I'm more likely going to recommend Nexus because it was designed in a different way to not be as invasive. And it has a support team around it. You know, you guys yeah. at Source mm-hmm. Elements. So the, it's, it was designed with pro audio as a number it, it, it one. It kind of meets the case. pro audio people where they're at. So there it is as a plugin in your in your yeah. workstation. Instead of here's this thing like oh if you want to use that you got to change your whole audio driver to us. But no, it's it's true that there's a big need to run virtual devices all over the place. And I mean sometimes I've got so many of them going on it's crazy. Here here's a really funny troubleshooting thing that I ran into a while ago. If you remember for a while Pro Tools native prevented you from having more than 32 inputs. That's that's the way Avid was going to make you buy the hardware. Oh, I remember that. And so we were doing this massive workflow and we ended up with more than 32 virtual devices. Like even though they weren't being used by Pro Tools, the fact that there was that many virtual devices Pro Tools is like <laughs> like I'm going to be weird and I'm not going to output anything. And it all had to do with how many virtual devices, because Pro Tools was trying to essentially do some sort of like, you know, I'm not going to do that thing. And it ended up getting in the way. So there's interactions that happen with these things. And you need to run a lot of devices in some situations. You know, I think for a home voiceover, reasonably, you're talking about probably three or four devices. I mean, maybe you have Source Connect 
You have a general communications like Skype, and then you have a phone patch. Maybe a fourth one like to monitor a web browser in your DAW or something so you can play stuff for your clients. Well, a perfect example of how Nexus changed things, well, for me anyway, even doing podcasts, right? I've been doing podcasts a long time before this one. And I always recorded a backup, but it always had to be in Pro Tools, right? So I would record, I would send all the channels that I was recording to a stereo bus and then off and into another channel and just record a stereo mix. But it always seemed stupid to me because if I ever lost the session, I'd lost the backup anyway. But now with Nexus, all of a sudden, not only have I now got three Source Connect connections running, plus Source Connect now, I'm also sending a stereo um, mix to Audition in the same computer to record my backup, which is getting backed up into Dropbox in the cloud. So, you know, I could never have done that before. Right. And then we could say, hey, Robbo, can you go to YouTube and play us something. And yeah, right, exactly. With one, with one aux channel and a switch of your sound device in, in your system preferences, and we can be hearing you go through YouTube. Exactly, yeah. that's right. And you so know how it, I did that stuff in the old days? Is I would install separate audio interfaces separate audio for, each, yeah, right. for each yeah. feature. Like I'd have yeah. a sound card or, or USB device just for Zoom, for example. Yep. You uh -huh. use those Behringers. Yeah, the UCA202. Yeah. Well, the podcast I always did had like the host on Source Connect now connected to me. And then the, the guest would always be on Skype or Zoom or whatever. So I had to use my laptop for that connection and have a physical audio connection to Pro Tools to record the interview. Whereas now it's all in the box. So yeah, ma massively changed my workflow. Well, that's funny because that's what I did a session last night and I've done a few of these where I have t both machines going. So I'm capturing audio on the big machine and then uh, using uh, Zoom through the laptop. Yeah, you better hit up Robert for a Nexus account then. Yeah, we, can, <laughs> we, we now have Nexus for Windows. We've had it for you a do. year. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any are there any limitations or or ways that the Windows Nexus is crippled or or it's, even possibly better than the Mac version? On some um, level? it's not better because Windows. Um, right. So so what it looks like the plugin is exactly the same. That one of the differences, you know, how there's Nexus control and you can just be like conjure me up an audio device, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Windows, you have to run the installer and you have to install as many audio devices as you want. I see. It's like happens. It has to happen in the installation process. Gotcha. So then, once you have your virtual devices, to name them, you have to go like Windows Sound Preferences Properties. Then you go into them and you can name them. And even after you name them, they still retain some portion of the default name that they were assigned, uh -huh. which makes all the names really long. <laughs> um, and then pretty much it's all the same with every application, except for those that need ASIO. So we uh, don't have an ASIO device. We have a, I call them WhatsApp devices, but you know what I'm talking about? Like Windows. Wasapi. Wa wasapi, yeah, Wasapi, whatever. We, we used to use ASIO for all. I, I don't know, George, are you familiar with ASIO for all? Okay. But for some, whatever reason, ASIO for all didn't work. So now we use Flex ASIO, okay. which is way more flexible. Uh -huh. And for most things, you can just install it. And there's like a little page we have where you install it and you have to like, you, you set your whole sound preferences to that. There's two ways, or you use this text file that we give you. Oh, this is something you have to get from GitHub. This is not like a super user-friendly... Uh... Right, you don't, you don't actually... Like, like, like we have a link there that goes to GitHub, but you don't really have to go to GitHub, but we give you a file. And then that's exactly where it is, is like to get like the full breadth of it, if you're dealing with anything that's ASIO drivers, you got to deal with this... Flex ASIO thing, which once yeah. you get it set up, you're like, okay, done. And now it all works the same. Yeah. But getting over that freaking hump is right. a little bit annoying. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in the end, once you've gone through that more painful setup process, you can get the same level of performance, the same mm -hmm. functionality, the same latency, all that kind of stuff, essentially. All that. Yeah. You send any app to any app, send any app into your, you know, into your workstation, out of your workstation to any app. You don't need... The the one that everyone was using prior to that was uh, I think they call it virtual cables and there's like potato and banana yes. yeah and voice um, meter potato and banana yeah yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I know people use this stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, um, 
so so that's a lot more ba- that's basically like the loop back of windows right yes yes and and so again using that one you're like oh if i want to use this with my audio workstation i have to change my whole audio workstation over to this virtual device and then it virtually feeds the inputs and outputs whereas nexus being a plug-in it's much easier to not disturb your whole setup it doesn't make you change your audio device for your workstation it lets you add in those inputs and outputs on the plug-in level to your workstation instead of on the driver level. Here's a, here's a missing feature, right? And this mm-hmm. is not this is something I've wanted for a while. And you're going to tell me why would you want that? Okay, why would you want that, George? <laughs> exactly. So you know, in Twisted Wave, it's a it's a it's a destructive single track editor, right? If I want to mm-hmm. process audio, it's always done. So you post, can do it. and it's done through a stack, and I'm really good at that. And I have that dialed, right? I would like to make a pre-input stage stack, and yeah, I would yeah, like I to route that in through something like Nexus. So, so I'd like so Nexus make your to stack host in Reaper. Well, I know I can do that in Reaper, but I don't want to use Reaper. I want to use no, 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 Twisted no, 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 Wave. No, hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me okay. out. Make your stack in Reaper. Yeah. And Reaper is actually highly customizable. So if you take the time, you can like rip its GUI down to nothing. Yes, you can. Okay. And then at the end of your plugin stack in Reaper is a Source Nexus plugin. And yep. you can go to Twisted Wave and make Source Nexus your input. Yeah. I mean, yes, that would work. That would work. And there's been solutions. I want a I want a George the Tech approved solution that is really simple. That anybody I can send a link, say click, boom, here you go. Now I know with Reaper I can send a yeah. preset file with Reaper and it would essentially do the same. Uh, it just it it just when I bring Reaper into the mix, it still feels like a bit of a house of cards. I've got mm-hmm. Reaper involved, I've got hardware configuration to set up in Reaper, I've got Nexus involved, and then I've got Twisted Wave involved as well. And a lot of the reason people use Twisted Wave is that it's not complicated. So right. this is just a wish list item. I know there's ways to make That's make it work, very achievable. But That's this is very, a very this is a wish list thing for me. So just saying, if anybody at Source Elements is listening out there, hello, is anybody listening out there? I want a I want I want a that thing. <laughs> okay, and 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 you want this um, kind of like the waves Mac thing and Windows. You know that waves it's thing me. where they call it sound rack. Is that what it's called? DG Rack. And I know what you're talking about. Did you know the Waves has a, a a host that will host all the Wave plugins for you, uh, and then that host can yeah, be used yeah, yeah. standalone. You know what I'm talking about? Is it called Digi? Yeah, is it called Digi Grid? Is that what it's called? Digi Grid. That's it. Digi Grid. Yeah. So I want a Digi Grid that's universal that runs any plugin from anybody, and can then insert that chain into any DAW. Without using another DAW to build the chain, <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> so I'm just saying. And now you can edit all that out because I don't want anybody to steal my idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna show you how to do it right now. Um, show us on this podcast, would you please? Yeah. That'd be so useful. Well, where's the download? <laughs> yeah, that's this? right. You know that idea, that secret one you had. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that one sound mixer app for Mac that you mentioned earlier, I think it does host plugins. I think it can do it. Which 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 app did I mention? You mentioned one of these virtual mixers for Mac OS that has a lot of sound routing capabilities. And right now its name is totally I can't remember the name of it. Um, sound Studio Sound Desk. Sound Desk? Sound no sound a sound desk, maybe. Sound yeah, desk. I, I, yeah. I think that was sound it. desk. That's the one. I've played around. I'm trying with sound to find. Desk. There's there's a very simple one that Apple makes. And um, really, I'm trying to find. Oh yeah. Um, it's called. I think it's literally called AU Host. But oh. I'm trying to find the actual download. It would be funny like, if it had been made like 15 years ago by Apple. And, oh, it it has been and, made 15 and, years yeah, ago by and, Apple, and, and it's just kind of just slipped into the darkness because it's. Who who the hell um, who would ever want something a, like this? <laughs> Except AU me. Labs is a free digital audio mixing application that hosts audio unit effects and and that ships with Apple Developer Tools. Um, so it comes with the developer tools because basically what it is is the testing environment for 
AU plugins. And so it hosts AU plugins, which everything oh you God. want to use is available as an AU plugin. I've seen it. It's done. You know what we say about us engineers? We've forgotten most more than we've learned, right? It, I'm just trying I have to figure seen out how this to before. download it. I have seen it before. It's Yeah, it's very old. I've, I've downloaded it before too. It's very, very can... old. So something this like this in conjunction with Nexus would be the, that would work. So, so, so here's the rub, ready? Sign into Apple with your developer ID. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. So we need to convince um, Apple that this is something that should exist for the, for the, for the end user. <laughs> yeah. And what's going to happen is like, you know, but then we want it for VST and AU and Apple's only going to do it for AU. Yeah. Of course. And now, and now that um, I'm looking on this website, kvraudio.com, it says here are products similar to AU Lab. And now I'm guessing a whole another world of pain. Of, There's of a whole bunch of them. Meta yeah. plugin is one of them. Meta plugin, um, Magma. Yeah. Okay. This stuff's out there. You just have to know where to dig and what Google string of, uh, you know, uh, what to type into Google to find it, I guess. Right. And and also for you, it's finding one that is actually stripped down enough. Yeah. Here's one called a lot of them are going to be like, well, a, a lot of them are like, like they want to be instrument hosts. So, so you find yeah. this genre of plugin a lot where it's like, I want to play my keyboard, my vintage piano sound. Right. And I, just want an app. I don't want to launch a whole DAW. Exactly. So they make it, but then they make it bigger than it needs to be. Yeah. I need a really light version. You know, it's just really, really straightforward. It's, it's just the, the problem with, with what we do serving the voiceover community. It's, it's a very underserved niche of the audio production world. I feel like, um, and like when you go to trade shows like NAM and AES and everything, it is still like gr a grossly ignored niche. Now, podcasting is not. So when I was at NAM, there was a tremendous amount of talk around podcasting tools and solutions and, you know, softwares and microphones and mixers and on and on that were all around live streaming, video game streaming, et cetera. There was even pan tilt zoom camera companies at NAM this year selling video cameras, right? So at NAM. At NAM, wow. right? So they know. There's this mashup of industries, like stuff you would see only at NAB were at NAM this year, right? So it was interesting that that they're understanding that this is a really big part of being successful as an artist is you have to be online and you have to be streamed and you have to be seen. So there's a lot more tools out there. But um, anyway, this has inspired me. I'm going to look further into this. I'm going to check out these tools you mentioned and reminded me of because I forgot all about AU Lab. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about podcasting though, because um, what would be a bigger industry? Would it be podcasting or would it be voiceover? Well, what would be a bigger industry that produces profit for the producer of the product? That would be my question. So, voiceover. Like, <laughs> I'd have to say voiceover, right? Because yeah. you get a direct yeah. re you get a direct payment for a service rendered. Podcasting traditionally is completely supported by either donation or advertising. So it, yep. it's far, far more difficult for a podcast to raise money, as we are probably somewhat aware. It's way, way more difficult to do it. And um, it's not that it's not happening. And there's more and more podcasts actually making money now. But it's definitely a very different business model. But yeah, that's a damn good question. I mean, pod, there's more. There's Are there more people aspiring to or actually actively producing a podcast than there are voiceover actors aspiring to make a living in voiceover that's a darn well, good question that's the question that is a really i mean good we're question. we're we're hedging our bets or at least andrew is he's doing both that's right exactly. yeah that's true yeah <laughs> so am i <laughs> but it's, it's it, i i remember years ago when when um i was working on the the casting website and getting all the statistics and some of the, the numbers just blew my mind one in particular was um there were 250,000 people claiming to be voice actors in California alone. <laughs> oh, my gosh. A quarter of a million people claiming to be voice actors. I think actors. that's more of a statement about California. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe. We're full but, of aspiring you know, <laughs> everybody's in California. Right. Yeah. But if you think about that, if you think about the numbers, like even – if you think you're you're going to work in voiceover, you, you're going to have to buy an interface, you're going to have to buy a microphone and a pair of headphones. So if everybody, you know, all of these people are buying stuff, that is a huge marketplace. And not one microphone company 
or headphone company or interface company even thinks about voiceover. Well, here you go. This will blow your mind. There are, according to Google, there are over 2 million active podcasts on the internet today. Yep. So, I mean, yep. how many microphones, interfaces, you know, copies of Source Connect, blah, 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 is, is, is you know, is open to be sold out there at the moment? Well, have a look at Rode. I mean, they just released the uh, Rodecaster Pro 2. Yeah, yeah. They must be selling a truckload yeah, of those things. For sure. That thing was a, is a dominant product. It, it's kind of created a genre. I like, I like this one. Yeah, it's created a genre yeah. of itself. It's being knocked off by Tascam, Zoom, mm-hmm. and other companies mm-hmm. because it's it's an iconic. I, I would de- I would de- I would say that the Roadcaster Pro is an iconic piece of equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are radio stations here in Australia installing it as equipment, like not in the on-air studios, but in production you know, little studios. editing production studios and yeah. editing suites and blah, blah, blah. They're buying them by the fistful. Yeah. Yeah. For good reason. It's amazing. I, I mean, that they rode really smart because they just, they own that territory. Yeah. Yeah. They, they do, do, don't they? But there, there, there are others creeping in. I've heard some really good things about a Tascam competitor that has some you know, things that the Roadcast can't do, but now the Roadcaster 2 is out, so maybe it's going to now, you know, dominate What's again. What's the big features on the Roadcaster 2? I, gosh. I, yeah, I can't remember either, but I know they've, they've chucked a whole bunch of has a new stuff in there. <laughs> well, first of, well yeah. first of all, the, the faders are software faders. I mean, they're physical, but they're all assignable. They, they move. No, they don't. Okay. They don't. They're, they're well. just assignable, so... There's six faders. There's actually fewer faders, but they're all assignable. So, like, you don't have to waste four, three faders if on mics if you're one mic. So now you gotcha. can make fader three be like a USB return and make fader four another return. You know, like, it's an interesting what they did was they shrunk the unit down physically a little bit because it doesn't have to have as many faders. Do they, do they charge less? Nope. They it's, a thousand, it's a thousand dollars here in Australia. Yeah, it sounds so like seven fifty in America, price. I guess seven hundred. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's not cheap, you know. No, it's not cheap, and it's got it's got some other tricks up its sleeve, like it has native onboard MIDI control capabilities. That was like an add on for the old one, but now it's built into the unit. The trigger pads on the front natively out of the box act as switcher controllers, like a uh, for your for your video switcher. So you can use okay. that to control your video switcher. So if you're doing live streams of multiple cameras, you can use the switch, you know, all that stuff's now built in by design. Those are things that they sort of trickled in over three years on the original one, but now they're all native in the new one. And then, and and yeah. there's there's a bunch of other, of course, there's more bells and whistles, which right now I can't remember, but um, is it enough to go re- buy, if you have the old one, buy the new one? I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's a big enough deal that you'd want to upgrade. Oh, I know what I remember now. The preamps have 70 dB of gain. That was one that was one of their big party tricks. Yeah. yeah. So they went from about 55 or 53 or whatever it was dB to, to 70. So uh-huh. that was a biggie. Now they're like, you can finally plug, you can actually plug in a roadcast a, a road podcaster mic uh-huh. into a roadcaster pro and actually get a usable signal. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which yeah. you couldn't yeah. before. The, the, people were actually buying a hundred dollar mic, a and and then plugging it into a hundred and fifty dollar cloud lifter, and plugging that into the mixer. It wow. was the most ludicrous thing you've ever seen. I couldn't believe like yeah. people were actually doing this. Well, now you don't have to because you can plug an SM7 into it or any dynamic mic and pretty much get all the gain you need. That was a big upgrade, hardware wise. Yeah, but when you think about the price, I mean, I don't think it's expensive at all. Because if you no. look at things like, um, I mean, I've got the SSL two for instance, I'm using now. That's what three hundred US, I think. Yeah, Is almost. Right? It's gone up. It was like two twenty nine. Now it's like two seventy, something like that. Yeah. And that's US dollars, and you all you get is the two two preamps. That's, that's it. it. There's no, there's not you even know. a loopback. The SSL two, I love no. that thing. It has no effing loopback. I it's want as a simple loop. As it, gets. it just doesn't yeah. have any. It, all they can well, put a physical you, switch you, you on got, it. That would you got you got you got Nexus if you need a loop. Back. That's well, that's true. Bringing it back, <laughs> going full circle. Yeah. <laughs> You've always Nicely got done, Nexus. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was fun. Is it over? 
The Pro Audio Suite. With thanks to Tribooth. And Austrian Audio. Recorded using Source Connect. Edited by Andrew Peters. And mixed by Voodoo Radio Imaging. With tech support from George the Tech Whittem. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and join in the conversation on our Facebook group. To leave a comment, suggest a topic, or just say good day, drop us a note at our website. Theproaudiosuite.com.